Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to UT Dallas and to this year's Einspruch Lecture. My name is Niels Roma. I'm the director of the Ackermann Center for Holocaust Studies. And it's now my great honor to introduce to you Dr. Hobson Wildenthal. He has been a tireless supporter of the Ackermann Center, and we very, very much appreciate all of his counsel, encouragement, and support that he has given us over the years. Dr. Wildenthal. Thank you, Niels. Welcome, everyone. Uh, decades ago, we told ourselves and other people said the same thing, that we were the best kept secret in Dallas. I think we're no longer the best kept uni secret university in Dallas, but now we're the most inaccessible university in Dallas. So appreciate all of you navigating our, uh, our multiple construction sites to find a parking place here today. Uh, it is a, a really a vibrant time at, at UT Dallas these days and weeks and months. Uh, hope all of you saw the great news about our student of uh, s several decades ago winning the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last week. That was a great, exciting time. And in the inner campus, we've opened up some of the, the old construction zones into our new uh, transformed landscape. And uh, last week, an old friend and I were walking, and he said, Hobson, uh, when you came here 23 years ago, could you have envisioned what the university has become? And I said, I had to stop and think. I looked around, I said, no, I really don't have that much vision. I, I knew the direction we wanted to go, but I, I don't think I could have envisioned the university. But uh, the key point is that in some sense there's no such thing as a university. A university is a collection of faculty and students. And the fact that UT Dallas has made, uh, I think, wonderful progress over the last 20 years really just means that our students and our faculty individually and collectively have made uh, great progress over the years. And uh, not a single faculty member exemplifies this more uh, than Juzi Oshvath, who created the Holocaust Studies program and has kept it growing and improving uh, these last 25 years. So uh, when I say that UT Dallas is going great, or what I mean to say is that Juzi and her colleagues on the faculty and her students are leading the way, making UT Dallas the university it is now and is becoming still. So uh, I say it really is a, a great time at UTD and we're really happy to have you with us this afternoon. And now it's my pleasure to ask Sully Belofsky to come up and do the important formalities. Sully? I too will be brief. Um, my name is Sally Belofsky, and I have the honor of serving as chairman of the advisory board of the Holocaust Studies Program. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the advisory board. Thank you for your support, especially uh, those of you who are friends of the Holocaust Studies Program. Uh, we have our annual campaign, and many of you contribute to it so that we can uh, do many, many of these outreach programs at no charge to the, uh, to the community. So thank you for that, and thank you for being here. Uh, we have an advisory board. You have a program uh, that lists the names of our wonderful advisory board. Um, they are benefactors, and I, I'm not good at languages, but benefactor maybe comes from the Latin, doing good. So they do good, and they don't get paid, so we call them good for nothings. So that's, that's, what, that's what we are. But uh, we're happy to serve, we're honored to serve, and to, to even be close to this great university and this great faculty uh, is a blessing, and we're, we're proud to be part of it. Uh, we want to, on the behalf of the board, welcome Dr. Bartov, distinguished, distinguished author, lecturer, um, historian, and uh, uh, we're just really, really happy to have him, and I know you're going to be thrilled. Uh, 
we have many of our board members here today, but there's one board member that I, I need to uh, acknowledge and introduce to you. Uh, it was on April 3rd, uh, 2011, that we dedicated the Ackerman Center here on the campus. And it was named in honor of Mr. Ed Ackerman, who all these years has provided us with leadership, with contributions, and with wisdom. And we're honored to have Ed with us today, and I'd like to acknowledge him being here and express our appreciation to Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for all you've done and all you continue to do for us. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Juji Ashvat, who uh, Hobson just mentioned is, is our founder. She, she started the Holocaust Studies program 30 years ago. We will be honoring uh, Juji next year in April um, uh, to recognize all her contributions. She is the guiding light. She is the the heart and soul of the Holocaust Studies program. And uh, I'd like to call on Juji now to introduce Professor Bartow. Thank you so much, Sally. Uh, I really am undeserving uh, listening to all these Raises. Uh, thank you very much. We are grateful to so many people. And in the first place, and above everybody, I feel, and we all feel, I am sure, uh, it is uh, Dr. Hobson Wildenthal who made this whole thing as it exists possible. And I am incredibly grateful for that, Hobson. But for everybody else, too, and so, um, uh, we are very lucky, and we are very lucky to have right now Dr. Omar Batov, who comes to us from Brown University. He's the John P. Birkland Distinguished Professor of European History, and he also is Professor of uh, German Studies. Um, uh, Dr. Bartov is, is famous from his incredible books and his incredible articles. Uh, I, we know him for years and we are teaching his work and it is wonderful. Uh, I very much recommend you to buy his books. They are very important. Um, one of, belong to the most important books written for the past decades. So uh, one of them is the Eastern Front, if you can remember, I don't know, is it going to be available? The other one is Hitler's Army, which is uh, an incredible book, and uh, Murder in Our Midst. Um, I don't want to uh, list all of them, but then the book Erased, a Vanishing Trace of Jewish Galicia in present-day Ukraine is another one, and there are many others. So we are expecting you to be very glad and happy and, and, and listen to what he has to tell us today. Thank you, Dr. Bartov. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for coming here on this beautiful Sunday. Um, I will speak uh, for about uh, 50 minutes, uh, and then I'm hopefully uh, we'll have some time for questions and discussion. Uh, as I speak, you will see um, very many images uh, I won't necessarily speak about them directly. They are part of the lecture. They're related to what I'm talking about. Uh, and if you have any questions about them later on, I'll be glad also to speak about them. For about 400 years, the town of Buchach 
presently located in Western Ukraine and formerly under Polish and Austrian rule, was the home of a mixed population of Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews. It was not a multicultural and pluralistic society as we would understand it today. And relations between these three groups were certainly not harmonious. Still, like hundreds of similar towns throughout Eastern Europe, Buchach was the site of inter-ethnic and inter-religious coexistence. Between 1941 and 1944, Buchach was transformed into a site of genocide. During that brief span of time, a small force of German police, amply assisted by, by local Ukrainians, murdered the entire Jewish population of the town. In the latter part of this period, Ukrainian nationalists also ethnically cleansed the Polish population. By the late 1940s, Buchach had been transformed into an almost purely Ukrainian town, many of whose inhabitants had only moved into it after the end of World War II. It had, and still has, very few memories of its pre-war past. And yet, thousands of corpses of its former Jewish inhabitants lie buried in shallow mass graves near the town. Their bones still occasionally surface during the thaw. In 1955, I, sorry, in 1995, I interviewed my mother about her hometown of Buchach. We had never spoken about her childhood. In the Israel of the 1950s and 60s, where I grew up, children were not supposed to be interested in where their parents had come from. We were expected to look forward with hope and optimism rather than look back with sorrow and nostalgia. The past was a Nazi black hole that had swallowed up everything. In its own sinister way, it had enabled us to focus on the sun rising in the east instead of lingering on the catastrophe. We too then had no memory of that past, even as we grew up surrounded by its survivors. My mother was making chicken soup when I turned on the tape recorder and simply asked, tell me about your childhood. For the next 90 minutes, she spoke, almost with no interruption, save for offering food to my seven-year-old son and checking on my baby daughter napping in her seat by the kitchen table. My mother was born in 1924 in Kosmiezin, a small village on the banks of the Dniester River, not far from Buchach. The widowed Grafina, as she was called, the Duchess, Pototska, lived nearby. My grandfather, Israel, and his brother, Mendel, used to play with her two sons when they were young. <clears throat> the Pototskis, among the most powerful Polish noble families for several centuries, had owned the city of Buchach until it was taken over by the Austrians and retained much wealth and influence in the region. My great-grandfather had managed the Pototsky estate in a town called Potokswater, also nearby. And it was there that my mother and her parents moved shortly after her birth. But the following year, they settled down in the larger town of Buchach, where they remained until they immigrated to Palestine in 1935. Save for my mother, her two brothers, and her parents, as well as two uncles, the rest of the family on both of her parents' sides was murdered. After years of research, about 20 years, I still do not know how they died. They vanished without a trace. Only my mother's memories, those of a girl 
who left at the age of 11 and, had, and never saw them again preserved a few names and memories that do not amount to much more than disembodied anecdotes. There were no more interviews. My mother and I had planned to go to Buchach together. She had not been there for 60 years. But soon after the interview, she fell ill and passed away in 1998. She was spared seeing the complete erasure of the Jewish Buchach she had fondly remembered. In 1942, at the height of World War II, the Polish Anders Army, made up of Polish citizens, deported to the Soviet Union and mobilized into a military formation after the German invasion, arrived in Palestine on their way to join the British Army. In its ranks was Theodor or Toshko Pototsky, grandfather Israel and Uncle Mendel's childhood friend. They had played ball when they were kids. This scion of a great noble clan sought out and found them, Mendel, who had fled Poland as a communist, and Israel, who was transformed by his Zionist aspiration, aspirations into a manual laborer. They sat up all night, drank vodka, and Toshka related all he knew about the fate of the Jews of Buchach. He then left to fight in Italy. None of them never ever returned to Buchach. In truth, my mother did not remember all that much about Buchach. To me, the interview with her served mostly to establish an intimate link with a town in Eastern Europe of a type that I had wanted to study for other than personal reasons. One that was representative of the hundreds of towns and cities scattered along the vast swath of land stretching from the Baltic to the Balkans, the borderlands of Eastern Europe where the great empires of Russia and Germany, the Habsburgs and the Ottomans touched each other. A world shattered by the destruction of World War I and entirely eradicated in World War II. Buchach was the hometown of Nobel Prize laureate Shmuel Yosef Agnon, many of whose novels and stories recreated the lives of its Jews, even though he had left it in 1908, age 19, and save for two brief visits, never returned. It was, in Agnon's literary imagination, a Jewish town. But as I was later to learn, it was just as much a Polish town for the Poles and the Ukrainian town for the Ukrainians. My goal was not to write a family history. What I wanted to understand was how the Holocaust, a state-directed, continent-wide undertaking that encompassed hundreds of thousands of perpetrators and millions of victims, had occurred on the local level. <clears throat> For long, it had been argued that genocide necessitates first dehumanizing its victims. It was this that made for the creation of the extermination camps, which facilitated a distancing mechanism between the perpetrators and the murdered. Jews would be transported in sealed trains from all parts of Europe, and upon arrival at the camp would be rapidly selected, forced to undress, shaven, cramped into gas chambers, and then incinerated, thereby being transformed from living human beings into ashes in a matter of minutes. The process was geared for speed and efficiency, but at its core was a radical psychological dissociation between the operators of the murder machine and its products. But the fact of the matter is that about half of the victims of the Holocaust, just like all victims of numerous other genocides in the 20th century, were not killed in extermination camps. In the case of the Holocaust, many of them were killed in or near their villages, towns and cities, mostly in Eastern Europe. 
and the western parts of the Soviet Union, where most of European Jewry lived. Even those who ended up being taken to extermination camps were often first under German occupation for months, sometimes years, especially in the numerous small towns that dotted the landscapes of Eastern Europe. By the time the killing began, many of the perpetrators and victims had come to know each other by name. The killing was public, not secret. It was local, not distant. It was intimate, not detached. And it hardly entailed any bystanders. Most of the people in these towns, Germans, Jews, and their Christian neighbors were engaged in these events to one degree or another. The case of Buchach epitomizes the ubiquity of engagement in communal genocide. Just as in other towns in Eastern Europe, when the Germans marched into Buchach in early July 1941, they made effective use of the fact that inter-ethnic relations had become increasingly fraught in the interwar period and had been especially exacerbated during the previous two years of Soviet occupation. Understanding how the occupiers established German order, Deutsche Ordnung, in Buchach helps explain how a couple of dozen Germans or German security police personnel had managed to murder tens of thousands of Jews in little over two years. But it also demonstrates that the Holocaust in Eastern Europe was never a two-sided affair of perpetrators and victims, but rather a triangular relationship whereby the Jews' neighbors played a complex and important role. Rather than dehumanization, familiarity became a key factor in what turned out to have been a vast and extremely violent upheaval that entirely overturned the previous centuries-long social equilibrium. Yet this also means that in order to understand the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, it is crucial to reconstruct the dynamics of relations between Jews and their neighbors long before the German genocidal machine had penetrated the region. For the question must be asked, what is it that makes for the lethal combination in genocide on the local level of dehumanization and intimacy and the resulting excess in gratuitous violence. For killing your next door neighbor, your dentist, your daughter's classmate is very different from killing anonymous, disheveled, exhausted figures stepping off a train. One may feel pity or sorrow for the latter, but in order to kill those you know or to profit from their misfortune, you must consciously turn your back on them suppress any pangs of conscience, stir up all the lingering envy and resentment, recall long-held prejudices and stereotypes, perhaps even overcome your own self-loathing in a fit of rage and total denial of natural human empathy, finally transforming the person you once knew as a fellow human being into an unrecognizable heap of flesh and bones. The Germans had tried to distance themselves from the gore of murder by devising more clinical methods. But in small towns such as Buchach, the task was, to, was rather to rapidly transform intimacy into alienation, friendship into hatred, familiarity into strangeness, humans into hunted animals and piles of corpses. For this reason, then, I undertook to write an intimate history, a biography of a multi-ethnic town. This book, which I have now almost completed, I'm in the last chapter, tells the story of Buchach from its earliest known beginnings to its destruction 
as a site of religious and ethnic coexistence. I tell this story through the voices of the town's inhabitants, constructing a symphony of voices derived from eyewitness reports and diaries, memories and courtroom testimonies, legends and fiction. It is the collective voice of the town and its survivors. But it speaks in three different registers, because from the earliest accounts to long after its destruction, the story of Buchach has been told from distinctly different, at times contradictory perspectives by its Polish, Ukrainian, and Jewish residents. What links these stories to each other is place and time even as they often fail to acknowledge each other's existence. And when superimposed one over the other, these perspectives provide us with the kind of <clears throat> three-dimensional view that no single narrative can offer, a microcosm that represents an entire universe brutally snuffed out in a few months. <clears throat> Buchac is located in present-day western Ukraine, 84 miles southeast of Lviv, which used to be called Lemberg, or Lviv, or Lviv. It has many names. Its earliest records date back to the 13th century. The town flourished as a commercial hub in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and is known to have had Jewish residents since the 1500s. The Jewish population increased following the establishment of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which actually at the time was the largest political entity in Europe in 1569, as Polish magnates invited the Jews of central Poland to develop the newly acquired estates in Podolia and Ukraine. The Potocki family, which took possession of Buchacz in 1612, granted its Jews numerous economic and political privileges. Thus a pattern was established whereby the Poles constituted the local nobility and some of the urban population. The Jews became a major part of the city residents, managed the estates of the nobles, dealt in trade and commerce, and worked as artisans, moneylenders, tavern keepers, and so forth. And the local Ruthenian, or later called Ukrainian population, were mostly peasant serfs. During the 1648 Cossack uprising, led by Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the town suffered greatly. But by 1672, a German tourist who passed by the town named Ulrich von Verdum could report that Buchach, I'm quoting him, had largely been rebuilt, especially by the Jews who are very numerous in this town as they are in all of Podolia and Rus. This was not a compliment. He was actually anti-Jewish, but this is his account. That same year, the town was the site of the Peace of Buchach, in which Poland handed over Ukraine um, to the Ottoman Empire, and for the next few years, the Strepa River, which passes right through Buchach, became the border between these two powers. But as the French tourist who also happened by, François Paulin de Lerac, reported in 1676, the Turks accomplished a lasting destruction of Buchach. The city was taken over and destroyed. However, the town was restored a few years later. And when Dalirac visited it again in 1684, he noted that, quote, the Ruthenian peasants build their homes next to the gate of the city and under the guns of the castle. You can see the castle in the photo here. While inside the city live only Jews and some Poles. By 1699, town owner Stefan Pototsky could issue a new charter of privileges to the Jewish community, which facilitated the expansion of its economic activity. Within several decades, 
Buchach became an elegant and prosperous Galician town whose population included well over 1,000 Jews. In 1772, southeastern Poland was annexed by the Habsburg Empire, that's the Austrian Empire, and renamed Galicia, or Galician. The Austrians initially abolished many Jewish privileges and imposed a series of taxes and restrictions. But by the end of the, sorry, by the mid-19th century, most of the more draconian edicts were lifted and the Jewish population, along with the rest of the city, began to prosper again. Although the city experienced several calamities, including a deadly cholera epidemic in 1831 and a massive fire that destroyed the newly built synagogue and 220 houses and severely damaged the town's magnificent city hall in 1865, the constitutional phase of what now became the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the last third of the century witnessed further improvement in conditions of the Jews of Buczacz. By 1870, the town's 6,000 Jewish inhabitants constituted two-thirds of its entire population. This was the highest ratio of Jews in the town at any given moment that we know of. The first municipal elections of 1874 saw more Jews being elected to the municipal council than either Poles or Ukrainians. And finally, in 1879, the town elected a Jewish mayor, Bernard Stern, who remained in that position for no less than 42 years, becoming later also head of the Jewish community and member of the Austrian parliament. I like to think of him as a member of the Israeli Labor Party, people who stayed in position for all of their lives. These were all signs of well-ordered relations between the three main ethnic groups in the city at a time of great expansion of cultural and political activity and growing nationalism. The introduction of elections to Galicia made for various alliances within and between the three main ethnic groups. But while Poles and Ukrainians were vying for control over the region, the Jews could only maneuver between them. Other rapid changes were also taking place in Buchas during the years leading to World War I. By 1910, the population had grown to over 14,000 inhabitants, of whom just over half were Jews. Since 1899, the town had a state secondary school, a gymnasium as it was called, which registered almost 700 students. In 1908, more than 200 of them Jewish. Thanks to the gradual industrialization of the region, Jews could also be found as workers in the expanding factories, workshops, and breweries, although most remained artisans of various types. Yet the poverty of the province, and Galicia was the poorest province in the empire, meant that many Jews chose to emigrate overseas. Others veered towards Zionism, whose territorial focus was elsewhere, or towards socialism, which seemed to offer a solution to the vexing question of Jewish existence in an era of growing integral nationalism. Then came World War I. Buchach was devastated in the war and the ensuing struggle between Poles, Ukrainians, and Bolsheviks. World War I didn't end in that region in 1918. It went on for, until 1921. Over 60% of the houses of the city were destroyed, and some 2,000 of its Jewish residents fled for fear of the Russian army, whose anti-Semitic reputation preceded it. Abalev, a young Russian Jewish soldier, witnessed a pogrom perpetrated in Buchach by Cossacks in summer 1916. The town, he wrote, presented, I'm quoting, a terrifying picture of destruction, vandalism, and cruelty. In one house, he saw, quote, a terrifying picture of destruction, 
sorry, in one house he saw a boy of about 10 whose hands were broken and next to him his mother with a smashed skull and legs cut off. In the next house there was a dead woman who had first been raped and then beaten so badly that she died the same day in terrible agony. In the third and fourth houses, there were raped Jewish women, men with smashed heads and gouged eyes. In the hospice, I found five murdered people. They also showed me numerous Jewish houses with dead people who had been strangled, burned, and so on. The Polish school teacher, Antoni Shavinsky, who recalled the pre-war years with fondness, even though he resented what he saw as Jewish control over the city, similarly described Buczaj as now totally devastated and ruined. Subsequently, Ukrainian nationalist troops also ran riot in the city, which was simultaneously struck by a typhus epidemic that claimed many lives. By 1921, when Buczaj came under Polish rule, its population had been halved and its economy was in ruins. Even more significant in the long run, the war put an end to a regime, that is the Austrian regime, that had kept the balance and managed the relations between the different national groups, even as they developed their own separate identities. Rather than uniting them in a fight against a common enemy, the war ended up pitting these groups one against the other. The ultimate failure of the Ukrainians to create an independent state left a legacy of bitterness and frustration. The Bolshevik attempt to impose communism similarly cast a shadow of suspicion and rage. And the installation of Polish rule was deeply resented by the majority Ukrainian population. Finally, both Polish and Ukrainian nationalists suspected the Jews of supporting their enemies, associated them with the Bolsheviks, and excluded them from their own visions of future ethnically homogeneous states. The seeds of ethnic mayhem two decades later were sown in World War I and its immediate aftermath. Buczaj never truly recovered from the devastation of World War I. Polish attempts to colonize the region led to Ukrainian resistance and anti-Polish attacks. And the increasing influence of anti-Semitic sentiments led Poland, in Poland led to growing restrictions on Jewish access to education, the civil service, the military, academe, and so on. The ratio of Jewish students in the Buczaj Gymnasium and that the high school that was opened just at the beginning of the century diminished from year to year. By 1939, there were no Jews accepted. As Polish police reports indicated, the three ethnic groups kept drifting apart with cultural, educational, and social organizations clearly split along national lines. The Jewish community of Buczaj was undergoing a process of decline during these two decades. Poignantly described by Agnon in his famous novel, A Guest for a Night, based on his visit to his birthplace in 1930. Politically, the Zionists came to dominate the community, especially the youth. Violent anti-Semitism was not common in interwar Puchach, and many Holocaust survivors recall childhood friendships with Gentiles. But adults kept to their own ethnic and religious groups. Many others left the city, such as the historian Immanuel Ringeblum, who later organized the Onyx Shabbat archive in the Warsaw Ghetto, and Simon Wiesenthal, who spent the rest of his long post-war life hunting down German perpetrators. He was especially interested in finding those who murdered the population of Buczaj. Meanwhile, growing numbers of Ukrainians were joining the Buczaj branch of the militant organization of Ukrainian nationalists, known by its acronym as OUN. Many of them later featured as members of the militia and German-controlled police, 
and played an active role in murdering their Jewish and Polish neighbors. When the Soviets entered Buchach on September 18, 1939, this was part of dividing Poland between Soviet Union and Nazi Germany after the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact that actually enabled Hitler to go to war. Uh, not a few Ukrainians greeted them as liberators from Polish oppression. Similarly, young working class and politically active Jews believed that the new regime would provide them with greater educational and employment opportunities. But Soviet rule in eastern Poland quickly crippled the economy and greatly restricted cultural and religious life, while thousands of citizens were murdered or deported to the interior of the Soviet Union, each national group presented itself as the primary target of Soviet repression, an issue that has remained a bone of contention to this day, each group claiming that it was the main victim of the Bolsheviks and the others collaborated with them. The Soviet occupation of Eastern Galicia in 1939-41 had a devastating effect on inter-ethnic relations in the region. The policies of repression decimated the elite and led, sorry, and let loose a wave of denunciations and violence. The Soviets recruited people from among Jews and Ukrainians who had been marginalized by the previous Polish authorities. The association of Jews with communists, which dated back to the struggle for Ukrainian independence and the widespread pogroms of 1917-1920, in which up to 100,000 Jews were murdered, was resurrected and magnified under the impact of the Soviet campaign against Ukrainian nationalists, as well as Nazi propaganda against so-called Judeo-Bolsheviks. The more radical elements of Ukrainian nationalists under the leadership of Stepan Bandera, it's called Oun B, now stood ready to unleash their fury on what they saw as Jewish communists and Polish colonizers just as soon as the Soviets withdrew. As the Wehrmacht marched into Galicia in late June and early July 1941, a wave of pogroms swept through the region, claiming the lives of thousands of Jews, killed mostly by Ukrainian nationalists and German police and army units. On July 5, 1941, the German army entered Butoch, where it reported that a Ukrainian militia took over as local police until the arrival of German troops. The self-proclaimed Butoch Sich, this was the Ukrainian name for it, soon expanded to over 100 men, commanded by members of the local Ukrainian elite and representative of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. In late July, command over the militia was transferred to the former public prosecutor, a man known as Volodymyr Kaznovsky, who remained the district police chief until the end of the German occupation. You can see from this photo that he was later arrested by the Soviets and spent the rest of his life in Soviet captivity. The siege abused, looted, exploited, and murdered Jewish inhabitants of Buchach. Together with a few Gestapo officials from the regional capital of Tarnopol, in mid-July 1941, it executed over 30 former Soviet officials. And on August 25th, the militia, assisted by the Tarnopo Gestapo, in a mass shooting of between 400 and 650 members of the Jewish intelligentsia on the Fedor Hill, not far from the center of Buchach. This was the first mass killing of Jews in this town. There were at the time approximately 8,000 Jews living in Buchach, making up about half of the total population. In early August, the Germans established a Jewish council, a Judenrat, of 12 men and a Jewish police force known as Ordnungsdienst, or OD, that eventually expanded to about 30 policemen. These are Jewish policemen. 
The Judenrat comprised the elite of the local community. The former chairman of the Kahal, that is the Jewish community leadership, a rabbi, leaders of local branches of Jewish political parties, such as the General Zionists and the Mizrahi party, lawyers, doctors, industrialists, and other businessmen. Some were described as upright men and were eventually murdered. The last president of the Judenrat, Baruch Kramer, who was an industrialist, was said to have been killed in the last liquidation in June 1943, although there were some rumors that he had survived. The Buchach Judenrat has been credited with providing assistance to thousands of Hungarian Jewish expellees who streamed into the town only to be murdered in a mass execution in the town of Kamienet Podolski in late August 1941. This was one of the major mass killings of the period. About uh, 22,000 people were shot in one day. The Judenrat also set up a soup kitchen for the local poor and arranged housing for Jews expelled to Buchach later on from smaller towns in the vicinity. Still, most survivors condemned the Judenrat and the Jewish police for corruption and collaboration. The Jewish police, it was said, tended to seize only the poorest Jews who could not ransom themselves for the murderous forced labor camps in the region. Survivors reported that Judenrat member Dr. Seifer saw, quote, the poor as human dust, which was meant to satiate the German beast until the bad times would pass and thereby to save those worthy of rescue. Baruch Kramer, who had been a Hasid, that is a, an Orthodox Jew, before the war, adapted to the circumstances, quote, under the Germans, shaved and became their servant. Reportedly, he ran around with a hatchet during the roundups and betrayed the hiding places of the Jews. He was also said to have celebrated with the Germans and forced young Jewish women to come to these feasts. Kramer was thus seen by survivors as, I'm quoting, more of a collaborator than a Jew, in charge of a Judenrat that became a tool of the Gestapo. Similarly, the head of the Jewish police, Moises Albrecht, evoked bitter memories. Moshe Wiesinger, who later fought with the Polish resistance, wrote scathingly, the OD, that is the Jewish police, are robbing, killing, worse than the Germans. Albrecht walks down the street in an OD uniform like the Germans. He's holding a whip in his hand and woe to whoever will stand in his way. Still, some Jewish policemen eventually turned against the Germans or joined resistance groups in the forest. OD man Yannick Andermann attacked the perpetrators during the mass shooting of April 1943, was beaten, and then burnt alive in the town square. <clears throat> Policeman Yitzhak Bauer joined the partisans. I should say that I, I, I spoke with Bauer about his uh, past, and I can tell you about that later. Some of these people I actually communicated with. Um, se several Judenrat members also stopped collaborating with the Germans when they realized the scale of the killing. Some provided funds to purchase arms. Some chose direct action. Yankil Ebenstein, who, according to one witness, during his few months in the Judenrat, had become hated by everyone and was called an agent of the Gestapo, reportedly died a hero's death when he tried to conceal a bunker full of Jews in November 1942 and then attacked the Gestapo man and was killed on the spot. That day, as one account puts it, he was forgiven everything. Unlike the Ukrainian police, the Ukrainian mayor of Buchach, Ivan Bobek, was reportedly considerate to the Jewish population. But in the fall of 1941, 
extermination policies in the region were taken over by the security police or Sicherheitspolizei, known as Zippo, outpost in nearby Chortkov, that's a city close to Buchach. Assisted by 700 Ukrainian auxiliary policemen, as well as by locally based German gendarmes and Ukrainian police, during the next three years, this outpost murdered approximately 60,000 Jews in the Chotkov Buchach region. The German uh, uh, unit itself numbered between 20 and 30 men. This was all they had. Of the outpost's five commanders, only one, Heinrich Peckmann, was tried after the war, but he was acquitted of all charges. The outpost official charged with uh, Jewish affairs, Kurt Kölner, and the commander of the labor camps in the region, Paul Tomanek, both pretty brutal individuals, were arrested and tried only in the 1960s in West Germany and received life sentences. Albert Brettschneider, Kölner's driver and an active participant in the killings, and was also eventually tried, as was one of the gendarmes in Buchach, a man known as Peter Pahl, who was uh, a particularly brutal guy. But both died before their trial could begin. Investigations by the West German police showed a pattern of extraordinary brutality, abuse, sexual violence, and corruption. But with very few exceptions, the perpetrators of these deeds were not brought to justice. Evidence provided by German civilians employed in rebuilding the railroad tunnel and bridge blown up by the Red Army in summer 1941 and by their family members indicated that they had observed and at times also participated in the killings of the Jews, which eventually included the murder of their own Jewish workers. But none of them were indicted. Following the first mass shooting in summer 1941, that of the intelligentsia, Buchach was spared from large-scale killing operations for over a year. In fact, some people wandered in there because they thought it was a safer site. The first action, or roundup, occurred on October 17, 1942, when Gestapo personnel, aided by Ukrainian and Jewish policemen, deported some 1,600 Jews to the Belzec extermination camp. Hundreds of others were shot in their homes and on the street. A second action took place in November 27th. Approximately 2,500 Jews were deported to Belzec and many others were shot on the spot. Meanwhile, Buchach was being crammed with Jews brought from surrounding towns and villages. In December 1942, a ghetto was established. Oop. Stop. Um, which Jews were not allowed to leave without permission, although it was not sealed. The crowded conditions and lack of food, sanitation, and medication caused a typhus epidemic that claimed many lives. People were frantically trying to build bunkers or hiding places in which they could into which they could flee during a roundup, while others sought shelter in the surrounding villages. In early February 1943, a third action took place. This time, the approximately 2,000 victims were led to the Fedor Hill, a short walk from the town center, where they were shot in front of pre-dug mass graves. The bloodletting was so massive that the town's water supply was polluted. The surviving Jews were then divided between those who remained in the ghetto and others who were incarcerated in a labor camp on the outskirts of Buchach. Only Jews who could afford to pay high sums of money to the Judenrat, as well as members of the Jewish council and the police were admitted into the camp. It was considered to be a safer place, of course. Sporadic killings continued throughout spring 1943, followed by a fourth major action in April, 
when up to 3,000 Jews still living in the ghetto were shot on the Fedor Hill and hundreds of others were killed on the streets. Then in June 1943, the Germans declared Buchach and the surrounding towns and villages Judenrein, or free of Jews, clean of Jews. The surviving Jews, with the exception of those in labor camps, were expelled to other towns in the area, but most were killed on the way by peasants who plundered their belongings. The labor camp in Buchach was liquidated shortly thereafter. Some armed Jewish policemen resisted the Germans, and in the course of the fighting, many managed to flee to the nearby forests and villages. The rest, some 1,800 people, were shot and buried on the Jewish cemetery hill. As Elias Chalfin, age 17, testified in 1947, the Jews hiding in peasants' homes, barns, and sheds had to pay a lot of money to the peasants, who then went to town and shopped as they had never done before. This made things much easier for the Ukrainian bandits, who went straight to the houses that had been pointed out to them as hiding Jews, easily found their hiding places, and would immediately execute them in the yard of the house. Denouncing Jews at the time, said Halfen, reached unprecedented levels. The peasants themselves began murdering and chasing them out. Jews still employed in the few remaining labor camps and farms now became increasingly vulnerable to local violence. Esther Grintal, age eight, uh, 18 at the time, recalled that when the Ukrainian militia passed through her forced labor camp where she worked, she would hide in the toilet and count the shots, knowing by that how many people were killed. Later, Cossacks who had collaborated with the Germans appeared in the area and began murdering the Jews. She said they did not have enough guns, so they hanged people or killed them with axes. They came to our camp with some collaborators from the village. They locked us up in an empty barn. They began beating us. They shot a line of people with one bullet, but the bullet didn't reach me. Again, I was put in a line, and again, the bullet didn't reach me. So they began killing people with knives. I was stabbed three times. Yoel Katz, 17 at the time, at the end of the war, vividly recalled how the peasants surrounded his labor camp, shouting, all children out, we are going to kill you. Some were killed with axes. Others were put in a row with the same technique and shot with a single bullet. He stressed, the Germans who came from the front protected us from the Ukrainians until the Russians arrived. Conflicting memories of rescue and betrayal reflect the chaos and vagaries of fortune at that time. Edja Spielberg Fleetman, liberated at the age of 14, recalled that as early as July 1941, her aunt and cousins were axed to death by a group of Ukrainian villagers, including the children's female teacher, just after the Red Army had pulled out and before the Germans arrived. But toward the end of the occupation, she was hidden with her mother and brother by a poor farmer and with a wife and four children. The peasant woman reportedly said to them, it doesn't matter how long it takes. We will share our bread and potatoes with you. Still, she insisted that, quote, the Ukrainians were worse than the Germans, not least because in her estimation, 80% of her family were killed by the Ukrainians who were our friends. By that time, spring summer 1944, most of the Jews of Galicia had already been murdered. But without these personal perspectives, we would have known close to nothing about this period. Shortly after the war, Moshe Spiegel, age 49, testified that in January 1944, Ukrainian militiamen had murdered most of the surviving 120 Jews on the farm where he worked. 
including his 14-year-old son. It is important to state, he emphasized, that this killing was not a German action, but it was performed by Ukrainian policemen and bandits. Most survivors of that massacre were butchered in yet another bandit attack. The child orphans, reported Spiegel, were stacked up in a pile, while other victims were lying with open guts. The local German administrator, a certain Fatier, had tried to protect his workers. When he left, reported Spiegel, the Jews earnestly cried. But his replacement, a young German army officer, is said by Spiegel to have promised them, as long as I'm here, nothing will happen to you. We do not know the name of this particular officer. Our only source of information about him comes from the Jews he saved. A few hundred survivors converged on the town of Twuste, near Buchach, where the officer was stationed until the Red Army arrived. Some of the local Ukrainian residents of Buchach and its vicinity profited from the genocide by taking over the property of the murdered and finding new employment opportunities. The Ukrainian gymnasium teacher, Viktor Petrakevich, wrote in early January 1944 that although most people living in, were living in unprecedented poverty, some live well and comfortably. The war, he wrote, destroys and ruins some and gives too much to others, often undeservedly. On March 22nd, the day before the Soviets arrived, he added, people, merchants, artisans, and so forth, who lived in former Jewish homes are moving out. In view of the recent developments in the war, they anticipate Jewish revenge. For many Ukrainians, the arrival of the Red Army was seen as a reoccupation. For the surviving Poles, the Soviets provided a last minute rescue from widespread massacres by Ukrainian nationalists. For the Jews, it was liberation and the encounter with Jewish Soviet fighters was perceived as nothing short of a miracle. But for Ukrainian nationalists, the presence of Jews in the Red Army merely confirmed their view that Jews and Bolsheviks were synonymous and united in their determination to once again enslave Ukraine. The Jewish revenge feared by Ukrainians did not occur. The few survivors who returned to Buchach after the liberation soon left the town and ended up mostly in Israel and the United States. Buchach became part of Soviet Ukraine. By the late 1940s, the resistance of Ukrainian nationalists was brutally suppressed, and Buchach, now almost exclusively a Ukrainian town, sank back into obscurity. Soviet politics of memory denied any specificity to Jewish victimhood. A memorial to the victims put up in the Jewish cemetery in 1944 was removed. A Soviet tourist guide to Buchach published as late as 1985 merely mentioned that, quote, the Hitlerites exterminated about 7,500 civilians, avoiding mention of either Jewish victims or Ukrainian collaborators. The Soviet attempt to submerge the memory of Jewish genocide in a general tale of victimhood and heroism by Soviet citizens meant that very few people could learn about what had actually happened to the Jews, let alone find out about the collaboration of local nationalists in the extermination of one ethnic group and the ethnic cleansing of another. Since Ukrainian independence in 1991, the anti-Soviet fighters who were vilified by the communists are being glorified. Some speak now of a double genocide in which even as the Nazis killed the Jews, the Judeo-Bolsheviks had murdered the indigenous population and its freedom fighters. A new memorial to nationalist leader Stepan Bandera has recently been erected in Buchach. The memory of Jewish life and the manner of their mass murder has not returned. 
The mass graves are largely unmarked. A modest memorial recently put up by survivors and their descendants at the Jewish cemetery is already deteriorating and serves as an open-air toilet. The landscape of erasure is characteristic of hundreds of other towns in Eastern Europe. They remain unrecognized sites of memory in lands reluctant to remember both the richness and vibrancy of pre-war Jewish life and the manner in which it was torn out and destroyed. Thank you. Um, we have now a little bit of time for some questions. We have some microphones that we can use on the left and on the right. Um, let's take this um, and give the f first honor to Professor Ashwat. Is this what happened in Butach? Is this typical for all Ukrainian towns or are there some miracles where there are Jews around still? So in uh, Western Ukraine, yes, uh, which is an area that was not under Soviet rule before 1939, uh, this happened in numerous, numerous towns. And there is hardly, in the, in the small towns, there is, it's very hard to find any Jews. Uh, in Lviv, in Lemberg, there's a very small Jewish community now, and there's one in Ivano-Frankivsk, what used to be called Stanislavo, there's a very small community. But these, most of the Jews there are called Soviet Jews. There are people who came after the war. So the Jews who had lived there before the war are not there. Thank you very much. We have a little bit more time if you want to... Raise your. Yeah. I'm not surprised we have Buchach after the Second World War, and part further before the, before the Second World War. How, how many survivors yeah. of, of the. It's estimated that, that about 100 people survived. Uh, From what? How many did you have before the war? Out of. Uh, there were there, as I said, in 39, there were about 8,000. Uh, in fact, more people were killed in Buchach, more Jews were killed in Buchach than had lived there. Because Buchach served as a place that people were brought into from other towns and villages before they were murdered. What's so, happened to the collaborators after the war? Or do you have an idea? After the war, what mm -hmm. they did with them? Or did, they, did they arrest any? So, right after, not after the war, but as the uh, Soviets established their rule there, which is really in July 1944, uh, there's an, a fair number of hangings. They hang people. Uh, whether they hang the right people or not is not clear, because they don't have any trial. People denounce neighbors, and often these people are hanged. And in fact, several Jewish witnesses say that they used to go to hangings to watch the hangings, and they, it made them feel good. But whether these were actually people who were collaborators or not, we don't know because there were no trials. Later on, uh, there were several attempts by the Soviet authorities um, to try people. The early attempts were very meager, uh, and most of the people got off without any punishment. Uh, How about the collaborators, the Ukrainians? which you had a lot of them down there. What's happened to them? Because after, I'm a Holocaust survivor. Yeah. And after the Second World War, I worked with Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of collaborators. Mm -hmm. They all came before the tribunal. Yeah. And I wonder what's happened down there. Whether and, they got mixed yeah. in with the people. Yeah, yeah. And, and nothing much happened. Look, I mean, one th what the Soviets did when they reoccupied the area, they were fighting the organization of uh, Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army, the, the, the OUN and UPA, there were these two big organizations. And they were fighting them for another four years or so. 
until 49. By then, the Soviets used Soviet techniques. They deport very large numbers of people, including their families. So they send them to gulags and they send them to camps in Kazakhstan. Uh, some of those people, people were collaborators with the Nazis. Some are just victims of the Soviets and you can't quite tell who is who. So you have thousands of people who are sent off. Some of them come back later on, um, 10 years later. Because most of the Ukrainians after the Second World War, which they collaborated with the Germans, we had mostly of them, they were caught, a lot of them. They were, they were killed after the war. Uh, but by by who? With the, what has happened to the partisans? Were there, were there any survivors from them? Um, th you mean which, which partisans? You mean the Ukrainian nationalist yeah. partisans? Yeah. As I say, these were the people who were fighting the Soviets. Most of them were either killed in fighting the NKVD and the Red Army or deported to gulags and to camps in Kazakhstan. Thank All right. you very much. Um, any more questions over here? I think there was a hand up earlier. Any other questions? What happened? Ah, um, so, I, yeah. The, what the, happened to the Poles is the question. The Poles of Butrach and, and the whole region. So, uh, what starts, I mean, in 1943 already, there is ethnic cleansing of Polish populations in eastern Poland. It begins in a northern, in, in a northern province in Volhynia, uh, and uh, tens of thousands are either killed in massacres or flee. Yes, by, by Ukrainian nationalists. The, the Poles are fighting back, so there's also, there, there's also mutual massacres. There are also massacres of Ukrainian villages by the Polish Home Army. So they're fighting each other, and that's a war that is not the official war. It's their own war. Uh, then the Ukrainians move south to Galicia, and they kill many people, including in the Polish villages around Buchach. So many are killed. How many... Uh, it's very hard to calculate because nobody was counting, uh, but thousands are killed. In this case, and this is why uh, this is such a curious uh, area that has not really been researched, the Poles are trying to escape from there, and the Germans are helping them. So the, the Germans are collecting the Poles and putting them on trains and taking them into Poland, into the old Poland. Um, so much of the Polish population, by the time the Soviets arrived, is gone. They're either dead or they were moved. But those who remain are then also deported to Poland by agreement between the communist regime in Poland and the Soviet authorities. And Ukrainians are deported from Poland into Western Ukraine, what becomes now part of the Ukrainian Socialist Republic. So there's a population exchange. So you have towns such as Buchach, Quite a number of the people living in Buchach were Lemko. Lemko is a uh, ethnic group from the Carpathians, and they were deported from Poland. And they took up residence in Buchach, probably in Jewish homes. But they were not part of the killers. They were not even there. They were simply ethnically, or through, due to population policies, they were moved from Poland to Ukraine. Uh, so by, the, by 49 or so, most of Western Ukraine, uh, most of the population in Western Ukraine is only Ukrainian, uh, and the Poles that were there were either killed or m moved into Poland. All right, let me now call on Dr. Bird Einspruch to present a little token of our appreciation. It's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Bortov, and uh, we want to give you this a you. small uh, memorial of being here, and it's a small package, but it actually contains a shrunk 55-gallon drum of oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> Please join me in there.